Greetings. Aloha. Hello, everybody. Hmm. Another week arose and passed away. Oh, it's good to see you. Mm. 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 Hey there, Phil. Yeah, feel free to take a look around and see your online community for the next couple hours. <laughs> I really want to know where Tad is. That he's wearing a mask? Kyoto. Yeah, yeah but I mean, where in Kyoto <laughs> with all these drawers? There's only one person wearing a mask. Yeah. So. <laughs> Looks cool. I'll have to find out. What's up, what's up Tad? <laughs> <laughs> and he, oh, let's see here. Hi, I'm at work. I'm at Hi. university. Oh. So I'm in the teacher's room. So I have to mask up. <laughs> Wonderful. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for hey. making it. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Eight in the morning or something. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. Wow. All right, Steve. Well, when you're ready, you can take us away. Let's begin by softening the senses, bringing awareness to the eye and eye door, the inner sensitivity of the eye that receives light particles, light waves, and the magical experience of the visual palette of colors seeing, seeing consciousness. Remember that consciousness is a mental phenomena and the inner sensitivity of the eye that receives the light and the light, the visual experience are physical phenomena. And if we bring our attention to the ear door, sensing the inner receptors, the ear sensitivity, which is physical phenomena and sound vibration, which is mostly a combination of air element and earth element, the friction of those two and the contact creating hearing, a mental phenomena, hearing consciousness, the miracle of sound awareness. And likewise with the other senses where we experience fragrances, flavors, and the largest organ of the body, our flesh, our skin, the receptors that receive elemental nature, textures, temperatures, vibration, movement. Body awareness, body consciousness. And then the mind door the mind sensitivity that receives the impression 
of mental formations, thought formations, emotions, all the phenomena that go into that creative aspect of mind, mental consciousness, the rich source of creativity in thought, in emotion, the miracle of thinking and the awareness of thinking happening just now, including whatever orientation our current mental state is drawing. Stability, calmness, restlessness, anxiety, curiosity, energy. And the, the stabilizing nature of mindful awareness that turns in on the mind to know the knowing as it's moving along, the knowing mind, the knowing consciousness, mind knowing mind. The more we do that, the more we always have something to pay attention to at the very core of our being. If we know knowing, all things can be known in our experience. The felt, sensing, knowing awareness of our practice. So having, having touched these six sense doors, six sensitivities, six forms of consciousness, just the recognition that the very awareness of them itself is a cause for calm, tranquility, stability, anchoring here and now in the present. So, that whatever arises in our experience, physical, mental, mind states, emotions, visual experience, sounds, the senses, all of our experience is itself the container for wisdom and awareness. Awareness sees how things are, the attunement to how things are is the resulting clarity, the pasana, seen as it is, intuitive understanding, And that intuitive understanding is the source for the continuation of the purest kind of mindful awareness, which arises from a mind that is tranquil, free momentarily of the extremes of attachment and aversion, free of restlessness, worry, just enough energy, even when our energy may be low, still enough to sustain the awareness and wisdom that we need, not to fall into spiritual slumber. 
not to be forgetful of how experience is continually in flow, in transience, in change. And the spiritual paradox of practice is the realization of the very nature of things changing, falling away, dissolving, that without awareness can bring anxiety and dread with awareness, it's, it's just the opposite. We're fortified by attuning to what's true, what's real. That there's nothing to cling to. There's nothing is sustaining and stable long enough to hold on to. Understanding that as a profound release and relief and opening and a, a wellspring of the energy, creativity, and boldness that we require to live. see within the body, what is the most stable anchor to sustain this moment to moment stream of silent, mindful awareness? Is it the body itself? The full body? The global awareness of the energy field of the body as it's pulsing and vibrating head to toe. Our particular areas, hands, feet, sit bones. Are the reliability of the breath. and feeling the breath, for example, from within the unfolding sensations of the abdomen as it extends, expands, rises, pushes out with the in-breath. And then it's gradual collapsing, soft sensation relaxing. With each breath like these rolling waves moving in circles, rolling waves of sensation rising and falling movements of the abdomen. And though we may be anchoring on the solid changing, breaking up of the sensations of the an breath anchor, in our peripheral awareness, we're recognizing the calm that's created from the sequential following of the singular breath process, just staying with one thing, even though it's changing all the time. The stability of, of the staying power of awareness 
brings about the tranquility and calm. It's the foundation of insight, the foundation of the intuitive understanding that wherever our awareness of lights, it realizes the impermanent nature of the selfless nature of all phenomena, the uncontrollability and the changeability of all phenomena. So just recognize how as that inner letting go happens, the relaxation of our system, the more clear and the closer up awareness is connecting with a changing body-mind phenomenon so that it's, you experience it as if being inside each moment's sensation, each moment's emotion of gladness or sadness, our energy, our weariness, expansion with metta, compassion, a contraction with dread, fear, And our capacity to hold anything just seems to continually open, expand. And whether internally, externally, in this moment or other moments, confidence, courage of being, being able to hold and see as it is all that arises in the physical stream of our experience and all that arises in the mental experience moment to moment. See for yourself but what's true here.
Thank you, Steve. Uh, most of you are aware, if you've been sitting with us, you know, in the Sunday sittings or in longer retreats, of something of this method, you know, that Steve just guided us through so beautifully of, of really trying to bring the concentration and the mindfulness together in this um, balanced and very integrated way that as we're building one, we're building the other and um, trying to include as much as we can in the scope of that, uh, as well as uh, understanding where we might need boundaries and more seclusion and um, protection in terms of the, the limits of what we're focused on. And that that really is the, that balance and integration is so much of how we think about how we've trained and trained others in, in terms of the practice. Many folks also know that there, there is a, a method of practice that's you know in the tradition and in many places um, that kind of parses them up a little bit in a different way, some of the concentration and mindfulness. In particular, just to say there's a, a form of, of trying to get extremely concentrated uh, into a real state of absorption where things can feel very stable and very fixed. And the emphasis really is on creating that sense of stability um, and the, the beautiful feelings that arise from that. And then intentionally letting that state of absorptive concentration go and bringing in the mindfulness to watch what happens, to watch the changing nature of phenomena and that that's how the kind of insight, the mechanism of insight happens in that process. So you can see it's kind of, it's the same ultimately, and there's a distinction in terms of some of the method around it. And even though that isn't primarily what we, the method that we primarily teach in, uh, there is something important to recognize about that, some basic truth of that experience, like principles of it that are actually at play for all of us in our practice. And even now, you know, to go from a period of, of more protection, of more seclusion, right? Our eyes are closed. We are trying to kind of get out of the conceptual world or sort of limiting the, to some degree, the range of, of where the mind's attention is kind of wandering and uh, trying to bring it into the sort of non-conceptual direct experience with the sense phenomena and mind phenomena. And then we, we come to end our sitting. And there's a very powerful process of, of watching then what happens uh, that I think it's sometimes not always explicitly integrated into our practice. We sort of think of our meditation as the 20 minutes we sit or the 40 minutes we sit or the hour we sit. And there's something very important actually about seeing what's the meditation like during that period of seclusion. And then can we watch another 20 minutes, another 45 minutes, another hour after we've sit to see sort of like what takes shape, what unfolds and what are, what can we learn from that? And that's true also for longer periods of practice, you know, for a nine day retreat, you go on retreat for a while, you have this period of seclusion and then coming out, there's a real value of, of watching your, watching the mind, watching the body over the ensuing days, you know, watching some of the armor come back on, watching some of the defenses reemerge when the, when the stability of the concentration might be lost, but the mindfulness is still very strong. And what do we learn in that process? And so I've been going through my version of that process and it's been powerful. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk, um, about, you know, I had been on retreat for a few months this winter. And um, one of the things I talked about was about how in that context of the seclusion, the, the reality of the coup in Burma and what was happening there and the military and the protesters and all this stuff was very much alive in my practice. 
And it was amazing to be able to experience the ways in which in that context, I was still able to really keep a very deep, powerful connection to the spiritual values of compassion and tenderness and care and understanding and, and peacefulness of heart, even with something that I was really deeply upset with. And so since coming off of retreat over the last, I don't know how many weeks it's been, it's been very powerful to see that capacity fade <laughs> to some very, to a humbling degree, you know? And, um, and so I wanna be careful in this talk, but I do wanna bring up sort of these four instances of uh, intense argument and conflict that I've had over the last couple of weeks um, as a way of reflecting upon this and, and, and also to reflect upon the, the sort of nature of, of how complicated it is of what we're trying to do in terms of developing our spiritual lives in the world and in the reality of engagement with other people and with you know, a greater phenomena in the world, even outside sometimes of our own direct experience. And to say, just as a forewarning, you know, that these are still things that are alive in me. And so the degree to which there's still emotional content, um, of course, I'll try to be careful with and honest about, um, but also to know that, th that there is a point besides complaining that I, uh, to this talk, which we'll <laughs> get to. The first, the most recent thing in the last few days has been a um, just a, a conflict with a, I'm supposed to teach this fall at a center. It's the first time, you know, coming back in person. Uh, and uh, our team asked if we could bring Darine on as a uh, assistant. And so the, the center was like, great, yes, absolutely. But we're not going to pay for her air travel. And so, because we don't pay assistance air travel or trainees air travel. And so it, it has raised these sort of intense emotions <laughs> in me about, you know, these sort of like behemoth uh, bureaucracies that are very quick to make statements about their alignment with all kinds of values around people of color and gender and economics and justice. Um, and yet when it comes to actually like shelling out a couple hundred dollars to like realize that in the material world, there's suddenly like mm, things are more complicated. And so well, I won't say much more about that, but just the question of this, this tension of oh, a place where we are supposed to have sort of show up with spiritual values to this institution. And yet they show up with just material values, right? That actually the stuff around generosity and ethics and all of these things are not actually, we're how we're related to. And it's, it's that tension between like, if, if I worked for Uber, I'd be fine. Or I don't know if I'd be fine, but I would understand. I wouldn't feel tricked into being treated like an Uber driver. But, but there's a difference here in terms of that dynamic of like, oh, the spiritual and the material and who has responsibility around what. The, the conflict that happened last week was going to my doctor's office and walking in and uh, none of the other people in the waiting room were wearing masks doctor wasn't wearing a mask and he said I'm running a little late so I said oh, I'll be I'll be outside I'll be waiting and going into the doctor's office and he said oh you don't have to wear your mask in here I said I think I'm gonna wear my mask you know <laughs> and I said actually I think you should be wearing your mask and actually all these people we should all be wearing our masks and uh long story short it was like we were quickly shouting at each other it became like very intense and at some point I just was like, okay, I'm, I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten very animated about this. I'm really frustrated and I'm just going to like settle down and go through this thing with him and get what I need and get out of there. And then the week before or around or a little earlier than that, I've given talks about spoon carving in the past. It's something I've, I do a lot of. It's, it's, 
I'll be starting to do a little bit of teaching, um, not so much about practice, but around action and karma and the, the, the relationship between doing and, you know, becoming and creation and attachment and ownership and all these things that I think are interesting in terms of the places where the sort of spiritual and material come into a little bit of relationship. So I'm in a few different online forums or I look at people on Instagram or whatever who are spoon carvers because it's become like this big thing. And uh, on Facebook, I am on a little spoon carving group and people just post pictures of their spoons that they carve and stuff like that. And someone who I wasn't aware of posted something um, and I noticed that the name of their business was um, the name of a deeply respected Lakota medicine man who's still alive. And it's not like a common generic name. It's like very specific to this person, his family. And so I was curious. So I, so I, I got in touch with this. So this again, this is the spoon carving space. A lot of these places are explicit about not being political. They're not supposed to talk about things that are like controversial. So I got in touch with him outside of it. And I just said, oh, I noticed you have this name. Is like, are you, you know, was the name given to you? Are you part of the family? Is that sort of like part of your world? Because I am uh, connected to that world, to this, this particular medicine man. I've also talked about sometimes going to support my friends at their Sundance ceremony. And um, th this is their chief. And so, you know, he, my friends, their altars are given to them by, you know, this, this medicine man. So I have, a, you know, a little sort of stake and kind of interest in it. And so, no, long story short, he has no connection to this place. He's white and he didn't want to get into it. And so we had some conflict <laughs> around that. Um, I felt, I really, again, it was a place where I tried to be actually much more careful than with my doctor uh, and try to sort of get the sense of like, oh, okay, like you care about craft, you care about, uh, you know, lineage and respect for things. And here's a place where, um, our actions matter and we have an opportunity to actually change a dynamic of like stealing native people's names and st like stuff and uh, kind of vibe uh, for the sake of, you know, whatever someone might be interested in or for the sake of w whatever other thing and that there's a chance to like do some good and change that. And he was unmoved and kind of abruptly sort of cut me off. And so I brought the, oh, I'll say some more about that. So then, and then finally, the last thing was I paddle. Of course, I've sometimes like give, I've given a few talks on paddling and I go out on the canoes. And ever since COVID started, of course, I've just gone out on my own little canoe. But uh, now that I've been vaccinated and everyone's still wearing masks and everyone's trying to be super careful, I've gone back out to join this group that um, paddles in the morning. And so again, it's a place where it's like, don't talk about things that are like dicey. Blah, blah, blah. This guy behind me the whole time is talking about everything you can imagine that's like controversial, right? And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Like, okay, this is what you think about religion. This is what you think about that, fine. And then it came up around police and his views around uh, Black Lives Matter and policing. And, and I just like, like, I lost it. You know, I was like, I, I, I didn't lose it quite. I was like, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge this. I'm gonna have to sort of explain this sort of other perspective and, you know, uh, why, yes, you can't generalize that all police are bad. And of course we all, we have police in our families and, and, and yet there is like a sort of overarching pattern and discrimination and oppression of people of color on the whole thing, right? And uh, he totally wasn't having it. And the thing that got me to go back to sort of where this, where this talk is actually going is he said, I'm a firm believer in this idea that what you pay attention to grows. And to pay attention to only the negative and only the violence, it's like, that's, that's not going to work. And that doesn't change anybody. And you need, to, you need to be supportive of all the good that police do and all the da 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 da, da. And then I did, I, I kind of lost it because it's, it's something that when I, when I see these sort of like new age, uh, kind of quasi spiritual sort of like arguments to defend oppression in the social sphere, it's very frustrating for me uh, in particular. And of course these, I, I'm like the most, like what's the word? Like kind of like 
boring person on this paddling thing. It's like there are, people are like distance healers and like whatever. You know what I mean? Like I just like teach like vipassana. You know. <sighs> So we got into a, a, a pretty serious argument and uh, because of course, if you've listened to anything we've said, paying attention does not necessarily make things grow. <laughs> Even in the spiritual realm, it's like, I understand that there is a, there is a place for that notion, but you can see in Vipassana, it has to do with the quality of attention that you're bringing to whatever object that determines the nature of your relationship to that. And the mind and heart has an incredible ability to grow based on the quality of observation. But even that, we're never trying to observe in order to control, right? We're not trying to observe in terms of getting the outcome we want in that observation. And so this notion which I have friends who are big on, you know, this is, it's something that I have, it's a particular phrase that I've argue about in my head a lot uh, of um, what you pay attention to grows. And then around this, this, this guy who um, was using this medicine man's name, you know, another friend argued with me, you know, he said, what? He's like, who are you to say, you know, that this is wrong? Or maybe this guy was an Indian in his past life, you know? And it was just like another thing where I'm like, this is, it's like, you can't use the arguments of one framework to justify oppression in, another, in the other framework. And I think that it's like, so this question of where is the relationship between inner change and spiritual truths and social change and social truths. And, and again, for me, I am someone for whom conflict, because as an aversive type, I think perhaps, for, as conflict is generative for me. I, I, I find it there are sometimes points of clarity that emerge from that. And so with this one friend, there, this clarity did emerge of this notion that we can't or we shouldn't use spiritual truths to deny the complexity of social truths, right? We shouldn't use spiritual truths to deny the complexity of social truths. And we shouldn't let the complexity of social truths keep us from the simplicity of spiritual truths. And that's so hard. It's so hard to do both of those things. And for each of us, one side or the other might be more difficult. For me, it, it, it's very clear that when it comes to social truths, I, 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 can, I can let a lot of the spiritual truths sort of go out the window. But for, it's like that other piece of like, oh, right. How do we not let the complexity of the social reality and social truths keep me, how do, how do I not let the complexity of social truths keep me from the deeper spiritual truths and values, right? Of, of caring, of compassion, of uh, sympathy, of equanimity, especially when I'm confronted uh, in conflict around them. And, and how important that distinction is, I think, and how hard it is to actually be distinct about them, to not just always be forcing the social world or our views on the social world to fit into our spiritual views. And how are we not letting, uh, forcing our spiritual views to, be, to fit into our social views? And I don't, there's not a prescription for it. Uh, there are places, of course, where they are in such interesting relationship, you know, where it is, it is the social realm under which our, our spiritual values come into play, come into contact, come into confrontation or possibility with uh, other beings, individuals or other systems that are beyond just sort of individual action. And so there is this sort of dialectical alchemy between the individual and the social, the spiritual and the material. But to also not force them into a kind of one-to-one -one equality, right? To not necessarily assume that what is true in one realm is necessarily true in another. I think of something like, oh, uh, you know, we're all one. Now, I don't necessarily think 
the fat as a, I, I don't know how I feel about that as a spiritual truth, but I, I think it's a legitimate, it can be legitimately held as a spiritual truth that we're all one, whether it, I believe it or not. But as a social truth, that's obviously not true. You don't even have to, there's not like a moment where you have to contemplate in any of the conflicts that are going around in the world that the sense of like, we're all one. It's like, clearly we're not all one on that level. And so the forcing of that truth onto the social reality is a denial of the complexity of the, of the social or this notion that we'll never be free until all of us are free. No one is free until all of us are free. It's something I hear a lot in my kind of social justice framework and, it's, and particularly in the, in the spiritual social justice world. And on a social level, that's a legitimate view, right? That's a legitimate perspective that actually our, our, our dynamics of freedom and oppression uh, are so intertwined in terms of society, in terms of economy, in terms of everything that like, that yes, there is a way to see that like, that actually all of us need to be liberated from social harm in order for society to feel truly liberated, right? For any one part of it to not be, the freedom of one group to not be dependent upon the oppression of another. But that can't be true spiritually. If your liberation is dependent upon uh, the liberation of all other humans. That's not the Dhamma. Now, that might be fine if it's not the Dhamma, but then it shouldn't be called the Dhamma because that's definitely not what the Buddha said, right? The Buddha acknowledged all the human suffering in the world, acknowledged all depression in the world, and gave, realized, and gave a method for finding our way out of it, finding our way to freedom, regardless of the conditions of samsara, of the human world, of just the world of being and becoming, of birth, life, and death, of these, uh, you know, impermanent, undependable uh, suffering conditions that we encounter ourselves in. And so it's like just so important to sometimes recognize that things can be true in one realm, but they might not be true in the other. There might be things that are true in both realms. I, I don't mean to say that there's no overlap or that the, the those places of tension and coming together aren't really fascinating and worth exploring and worth really wrestling with. But we should be very careful about assuming that they're the same. And, and what do we lose in one or the other sector in our relationship with it if we don't acknowledge the difference, if we don't deal with the sort of complexity of it and recognize the difference between the different spheres. You can see, you know, we don't, most of our talks are not about the social world. You know, it's like, we will, we will reference things. We will, we will frame. It's like, we know, we know things need to be relevant. People need to feel secure enough uh, in our basic understanding of what's happening in society to feel safe, to come, to be quiet. But also there's this sense of like needing the protection of seclusion, needing to the protection of non-conceptual, of, of not having the idea that the Dhamma is about holding on to certain views, because it definitely isn't. And that is an important ethic for us. And so you'll see that, of course, like most of our teaching, most of our talks, most of our framing in, in the Sunday sitting kind of more open framework and definitely more in the intensive retreat container, we're very careful about how much we're bringing up all of the atrocities in the world and all of the traumas and all of the challenges that we face, you know. It's a dance. Like, it's like, of course, you don't want to be in denial of it. You don't want to pretend like it's not real. But you also, we recognize the need for that seclusion, that need for the mind to feel settled. And if we're constantly agitating, constantly bringing up, um, you know, all of the hardship in all of our lives, because there's all the sort of feels that we could kind of check off for people. And it's actually not conducive to creating the sense of quietude. And the Buddha, you know, himself had both, you know, both sides of this. I and mean, he would challenge people about individuals, about their uh, belief in, uh, you know, Brahmin superiority. 
and kind of try to break down logically the sense that there's racial superiority, you know, uh, and caste superiority. And um, he was very clear about the Sangha and periods of practice being protected from the volatility of um, social dynamics and, and, the, and the volatility of all our views and arguments about it, you know, and he sometimes would, would chastise the monks and leave them and be like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be here while you all are arguing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take part of it because you're, you're, you're not creating the protective conditions for practice. And so Sangha is this incredible value in the Theravada tradition, but it's not Sangha for the sake of Sangha, it's Sangha community for the sake of creating the protective conditions for practice. And that's a very difficult dance. It's easier in some ways in the monastic tradition where there's all these rules you just obey, you have to obey. You have to, if you're gonna be in the tradition, you have to sort of obey these rules. We in the sort of like monastic, non-monastic lay community have a different dance to negotiate of like, oh, how much flexibility, how much openness. And of course there's a huge range. You can see even for myself, right? I wrote a book about guerrilla warfare as a, as a metaphor for Vipassana practice. And I have total confidence in the Dhamma of that book and, the, and that our method fits into this weird metaphor in a very meaningful way. But you also see, like, I almost never bring it up, right? Like, I don't, I, I'm not talking about guerrilla warfare during every of our Sunday sittings. I'm not reading Mao, you know, to like our, regular sitting groups or definitely you know when we're on intensive retreat there might be times where I bring it in where I feel like it's an appropriate thing but it's like to know that it's like we're very careful just to just sort of frame that it's like I believe that there's something valuable in the metaphor I put a lot of time and energy in exploring it and I'm also like very clear how inappropriate it actually is for the the, the safety of the container and that things can be true in one sphere and be meaningful there, but it's co more complicated in other spheres, that we need to be careful about where we sort of bring those things. Just like Lenin said, uh, what did he say? Truth is never abstract. It's always concrete. And I think actually that the Buddha would agree with that, right? It, yes, there are truths. Thing, everything is impermanent. Everything's unconditioned. But it's always based. We're not supposed to be living in the view. And he he would give people a hard time about being attached to views. It's like no, you're. It's about the direct experience. The truth is in the direct material experience of of conditionality, of undependability, of impermanence, right? And so that truths come out are conditional, right? Truths. Are, are not abstract, they're rooted in concrete experience. And how do we hold those things? And ultimately, of course, and, and again, for all of us, it's gonna be different. For me, this piece of like, how do I not lose touch with the humanity at the heart of it, right? The love and the care and the sense of uh, possibility in all of us and how hard it is to be human and how confused we get about our views. And there's reasons why we develop certain frameworks, certain understandings of things. And that you definitely don't need to share my view of the world to practice Vipassana. And that is fundamentally important, right? And in terms of another reason why I think we don't always bring up all of the issues that we might feel strongly about, it is absolutely not necessary to believe what I believe about the nature of society and et cetera um, in order to practice Vipassana. It can't be, right? And in fact, there's this, it's like the, we actually do need to find the space and spaces, right? The sense of protection from views, protection from the stories, protection for our hearts in all of the entanglements of that, not to say they aren't true, but to understand that they're limiting in terms of our ability to go underneath and see what's happening underneath and abide and understand and be able to get the wisdom generated through the observation of our direct experience of mind and body.
one of the things that I think has been most important for me in terms of this is trying to always get to that place of understanding that when I'm angry or when I'm frustrated, um, particularly as a, an aversive type where aversion will be my go-to place of security, go-to place of trying to find stability and strength and confidence in the undependability of the world. Whereas other people who might be more in toward, oriented towards greed, uh, craving, um, you know, that, that is gonna be the place where they're more drawn to find stability, wanting things to be a certain way, trying to collect, you know, gather up pleasant experiences or delusion. Um, as, as a place of finding safety, finding protection, finding stability. We all have all three, of course. And delusion, particularly in terms of self identity view, uh, world views, all of these views, right? And fixations and selfness that kind of come up as, as an expression of delusion. We all have all three. And how important it is to understand and be able to watch the heart do it, right? Not shut ourselves down, not you want to be as careful as you can with each other <laughs> and 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 to not harm one another of course right it's like i have apologized now to a series of people for whom i feel like whether or not i was wrong that i let the aversion have more take up more space express itself more than was appropriate and in various conditions, in, very, in the conditions themselves, or just in general as human to human. And that need to kind of backtrack and to be ask, I don't know about ask, you know, I'm not sure if we ever really should expect forgiveness from anyone, but to understand that we may have caused harm because of our inability to um, be with the intensity of the experience internally. That we need to kind of dump it out on others. And so this sense of, wow, really getting, not wanting to harm, you know, for myself of like, not wanting to harm, not wanting to create more pain, more division, less understanding, more hardness, wanting there to be more understanding, but, but seeing that how hard it is to simply be with the aversion, to be with the anger, to be with the rage, and to see that the, the aversion or the craving or the delusion, right, the, the fixation on meanness and selfhood and views, that it does come from this fear of change, of undependability, of something that we care about being threatened or harmed. And that at the heart, at the, at the foundation of it, there is care, right? At the root of anger or grief, the root of a lot of the sort of forms of delusion is caring. Um, but the caring doesn't feel strong enough. The mindfulness isn't strong enough. The concentration, the love, the metta, the purity of the metta isn't strong enough to feel stable in that. And so the aversion, the greed, the delusion come out as these deeper protections. And to be humble about it, to recognize our own mistakes, to see how we are all really in this kind of confluence of conditions in the world. Um, and how hard it is to do, especially without support, especially without a practice, especially without the desire to be free from this kind of suffering. Um, it's very hard. And for those of us who are on the path and have any sense of, you know, commitment to it, of course, the, the deeper um, the deeper sense of responsibility we have <laughs> to show up for our errors and, and to apologize and to try to be uh, better, try to be kinder, try to be gentler, try to be more understanding, but still try to learn, right? Without shutting ourselves down, without being dishonest with ourselves. Um, where do we understand our role spiritually in ourselves? Where do we understand our role in the society where it is important to confront and challenge and um, not let injustice simply go by? There is no formula. Um, but it is a powerful and important thing to be wrestling with and negotiating. And, um, and I hope that we all feel like that to some degree. And just that, that encouragement is to just be very careful about conflating one with the other and trying to be very nuanced and sensitive and aware of, of, of where they might be different and where they might be the same and to try our best to come together around them. So we do have some time for questions. If anyone has any questions about 
your practice, about the instructions, about anything I've offered. Um, you're welcome to raise your Zoom hand. You can do it in that little reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You could write something in the chat if you, uh, if that isn't working. And um, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that there's time for questions. Thanks, Harry, for your thoughts on that on the chat, yeah. Okay, let me go up to the top here. Kathy. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk, Jesse. Um, and it's good to see you and Michelle back from your retreats. So, um, I had a couple of um, things I actually wanted to ask you. Um, so one of them is related to my longstanding um, aversion to pain during sittings. Um, and what I've noticed recently in the last maybe like week or so is that there's been almost equally intense pleasure that arises during sittings as well. And it's kind of like intermingled with the pain and it's like at the same time. And it's, I've never, I never thought I would say this, but like the pleasure is also really difficult to handle as well. You know, it's like, you just, yeah, I, I don't. Um, and I imagine like, it just feels very, um, strong right now and I imagine it would probably mellow out over time um but I don't know if you have any thoughts around that um and another question I had was around compassion um and the struggle that I have is that whenever there's suffering that I encounter um like at work or mostly through work um like sometimes there's a sense of like drowning um, in the sadness and like the sorrow and the grief of it. Um, and yeah, and I feel like the answer there is to like find some sense of stability or find something that's neutral um, to kind of protect myself because at that point, like there's no capacity for compassion because I'm drowning. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts around, around those two points. Thank you. Yeah, and actually before we answer, just the question about the the difficulty of the pleasant sensation, just can you say more about like, what is it that feels difficult about it? If you I can, think or if you want. Yeah, I think it's part of it is like the wanting of it. Like I'm noticing um, there's like wanting it to be a certain way or wanting it to stay. Um, and also there's, I think there's also a feeling of like, this is not supposed to be happening. Um, like I've realized, I think I have like a very difficult relationship with just pleasant feelings in real life as well. Like it's really hard for me to um, like just to not do anything and relax. Um, like there's a guilt, I think that comes up. Um, in, I haven't noticed this so much in meditation, but I know in like real life when I'm not meditating, I definitely recognize that, that there's like, you know, that sense of like supposed to be working, supposed to be doing something. I'm not supposed to be like enjoying myself. <laughs> oh. I was Michelle, are you, or Steve, I'm not sure who's gonna, who's joining with the with the questions i think steve i'm just oh, okay. observing yeah um i don't, I don't know steve, steve do you want to start or did, yeah i think he heard that. did you hear the i, I heard the last okay. part okay. okay i heard the last part and i'm just wondering if you notice 
that process that you just articulated to us, the pleasant and then the judgment or thoughts or attachment, right? Did you notice a difference between an experience you didn't ask for, a pleasant experience, and then the reaction to it, which is, should this be happening? And you're judging thoughts about it. Do you notice that difference? Um, yes, but it's, yes. Um, and I would say that I think what I notice most prominently is definitely like the, the wanting and then um, sort of like the grief, you know, cause I can feel it fading. And then, you know, you're back to sitting just in, in pain. Uh, and then it's just like, you know, and then it's like, oh, I don't want this to go away. And then it goes away. And then, and then maybe you'll come back a few minutes later, but it's just, it just goes on and you want some you want something else to be happening i don't know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh yeah i do want something else yeah, <laughs> yeah. i think it sounds great you know, I mean, it, it's it's so pure. If you could hear, if you could hear yourself from outside of yourself in a way, it's just, it's just, there's, it's. I think there, it's like we do start to recognize some of, like what I was saying about, you know, this. It's a very it, there. It is such a limited psychological framework that is in the sort of commentaries, but there is a value to seeing the sense of like, oh, are we more of an aversive type? Are we more of a greedy type or more of a deluded type? And I think that sense of really getting that, wow, we how deeply aversion, whether it's uh, disliking or sadness or fear or whatever it might be such a powerful defense of, of our systems against the uncon you know, uncontrollability of things. It's very powerful to see that and to see the realms in which it has like, oh, it has so much impact on our relationship to unpleasant experiences in one way, pleasant experiences in another way, neutral experiences in another way for sure. And 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 again, it's not it's limited. So it's, you know, of course we're also craving and we're also, you know, all deluded in our in our ways, but something wonderful about that. And I, you know. I don't know about smoothing out, but it will change, <laughs> you know, for sure. And it'll keep changing. Uh, but I, I think just to say kind of additional to sort of what I think Steve, part of what Steve was pointing to is one of the, one of the things that's very hard in practice is when you start to see a pattern in yourself that the perspective on that pattern, right? The place that we are seeing it from is often still within that pattern. It's not actually outside of it. And so the judgment about I shouldn't be doing this or this shouldn't be happening or whatever is actually not a neutral observer, right? It's actually part of that. that so, so that's what's sometimes very difficult when you start to notice a pattern and there's something amazing about noticing it, but you have to be very careful, careful about continuing to interpret the pattern from another loop that's another pattern or that same pattern or whatever. And so just like, it's like seeing the layer, oh, seeing the judgment, seeing the wanting of things to be different, finally maybe seeing the acceptance and just being like, oh, it's not just layers, it's moments in time that that thing is gone and now there's this and now there's this and now there's this. Sometimes going into more of a momentary framework versus a sort of oniony framework of like this underneath this um, can sometimes help us feel like there's a freshness at least to it or it's like, oh, I'm not stuck in these patterns. It's like, oh, in this moment there's this and this moment there's that, just like you did. You thought it was a concrete feeling period of aversion, but actually there's all this pleasant experience mixed in there. You're more tuned into the un unpleasant. And then you start to tune into pleasant and you notice how difficult it is. You see why the mind was avoiding it. 
right? But it's a cool thing that your mind is starting to see. It's like, oh, it's not just this solid block of unpleasant. There's all this other stuff going on, hard to see, hard for the heart to bear. And then so you have to have patience with it, you know? Yeah, sounds great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mia. I really appreciated you bringing up the discernment of worlds and this um, announcement that what we're doing is nurturing the space and protecting the space. But I would like to acknowledge that I also feel very relaxed knowing that you bring the discipline of discernment and the ability to say no to certain injustices, um, even if they aren't appropriate moment by moment in the practice, I feel they bring a stronger safety to the container as well. That the, the Sangha, although it's a womb and a nurturing, almost maternal space, that there's a, a paternal, also protective energy. So I, I thank you for that. I feel it's very welcome, even if it not demonstrated. Um, and when you spoke about, there was a wondering I had that came up when you were speaking about you know, is, are the, the teachers that have become enlightened or um, awakened fully, does that mean that we then resort to, we are all one or that the, um, the social sphere is no longer perceptible? And I, it made me wonder, are we not being taught by you and the other teachers that through the Brahma Viharas, we're attempting to cultivate a greater space so that we can hold all of the injustice, all of the pain, all the suffering, but with more presence rather than not being affected by them, but rather we're, we're allowing ourselves to be affected, but in equanimity or touched, but with compassion, like that we're actually bringing in all of the social into the spiritual. I wondered if that isn't what we're doing and I, I'd love your opinion or anyone else's. Yeah, I can start. I mean, I I definitely feel that that is really deeply true. That that equanimity, far from being a denial of the suffering in the world, that the deepest equanimity is that it requires the total co connection and non-resistance to all of the suffering, you know? And, and when you say in the world or in life, I mean, I think there is an ability for the human mind to fathom the a kind of non-personal truth to dukkha, right? That is, that is universal, for lack of a better word, right? And that that is actually absolutely necessary to truly be at peace with it. And that is a little bit of a paradox. I think that's that's hard for people to, you know, all of us at times to, to wrestle with. And I think I just, I don't think I can say about the other piece around teachers who may be understood to be fully enlightened or people in the past, especially acknowledging the degrees of awakening that are understood in this practice and how and, and in, in other traditions, you know, that there are people, like there are definitely people who were considered to be very awakened who caused like a great deal of harm, right? In their roles as teachers and in terms of sex or violence or whatever. And so you have this sense of like, where it, it can be easy, it can be, I think there's going to be a realistic sense of saying, okay, well, they weren't necessarily fully enlightened. And what would a fully enlightened, what, what is the view of the world and social dynamics of a fully enlightened being? And I, I, I can't say. And I don't know that it's, I don't know that we have examples that it's a standard thing either. I mean, I think, you know, Steve has a, a great story about um, uh, a monk and it's in the suttas or in the commentaries of, you know, this monk who was understood to be fully enlightened and, and um, he would just go around swearing at people and really being like unskillful in speech a lot. And these monks came to the Buddha and were like, what is up with this guy? <laughs> like, there's no way he's like, well, he's not playing the rules, you know? 
and there's no way he's in land. And the Buddha's like, you just have to get, he spent a hundred thousand lifetimes doing this, being like this. And this is just like residual stuff that's, it's gonna, it just has to play out and, you know, give him some space basically. And then you have the Buddha who himself had a very wide range of engagements with the social world around him. Some that were like really inspiring, some that might be very frustrating to people who maybe wish he was more radical in terms of changing the society around him or whatever, when he really kind of let a lot of things go, but challenged people very individually. So I just, I don't know that there is a, I think there's so many things that we can wonder about what it would be like to be fully enlightened. And um, I think more valuable is always going to be just that process of, of what's happening in our own minds and hearts and where is their dukkha where is their attachment where is it rooted in caring where is it rooted in kindness and like you're saying with the brahma vihara is like yeah what's the motivation um, but i definitely think that the ability to feel the suffering of human human life of existence of the hardship of it is actually a hundred percent essential to get to experience the deepest levels of equanimity and of love for sure yeah i know it was yeah long-winded i don't know steve do you have anything you want to add to that just to mirror your mention of the brahma viharas that is our window and doorway to social exchange and and a connection and making a difference. In, in my experience, picking up those practices, both for their internal value and because they're all about connection and they're all about relatedness to other living beings, that is our social, political way of expressing our spirituality. Thank you. Amanda? Hi. Um, thank you for your talk today. I have a question that I probably wouldn't have otherwise asked, but your talk was um, really relevant. Um, I had a friend reach out yesterday um, wanting some feedback and wanting to kind of reflect on cultural appropriation. Um, and it stirred up a lot for me just thinking about what my role is in, um, you know, engaging in a spiritual tradition that is rooted outside of my culture of origin as a white woman in North America and even having, you know, like taken robes in Burma and, and having things in my home that are from there and, and that you know, it, it certainly feels like those have been supportive of the practice, but I'm wondering if that's something that you've wrestled with and um, yeah, just if you have any thoughts. I've, I've, I, it like, it was almost embarrassing that it wasn't even something that I had thought about before in thinking about cultural appropriation, but um, seems like a useful inquiry. Steve, you wanna start or you want, whatever? Go ahead. I think it's always good to be like extremely careful. I mean, particularly in that kind of exactly, you know what I mean? That that um, particularly those of us who are not Asian, who grew up with some degree or another of white privilege and the sort of ability to, and, and whatever class stuff might be there in terms of being able to like, oh, take time off and think that it's like legitimate to just be like, go somewhere for 10 days and whatever you know, like there's all these there's all these layers right to like oh these are important things and to see that these are phenomena in our world that that are not neutral right they play out something enters the sphere of this society and the structure and it's going to play out along the contours and within the dimensions of that society and so there's going to be class stuff is going to be racial stuff is going to be gender stuff is going to be all those things because that's the nature of how anything plays out in a society and that yes in my view it's like super good and important and rich and enriching to be engaged in that those questions you know um and there's a side of it where you know 
Buddhism has the Dhamma, the Dharma has gone from many cultures, over, you know, from one to another, to another, to another. And the framework of the 21st century of being like, oh, well, that's Asia is not necessarily the framework that that happened during that era, right? We can say the Buddha was from India, but it wasn't India then, right? The, the, these are actually vastly different cultures to go from, you know, Southern Nepal, India, you know, from to Sri Lanka, to Burma, Thailand, China, Japan, Korea. I mean, the, comp the, the traditional range of cultures that encompass the traditions of Buddhism, and Mongolia, Tibet, all of those things, it's like hugely distinct from one another. So the Dhamma has never, it's always been offered, for, you know, in the sense of freely to who are interested. And so there's a basic level of like total sense of legitimacy that is not culturally specific in its essence and that we are incredibly careful and in terms of my view or, and i feel like we try to be as rigorous as possible about maintaining our connection to burma right which really we could say started with steve right going there and you know michelle didn't practice there as a yogi and it's like he had that connection he created this sort of connection to Saida upandita and Saida lakana that gets us you know going to chazwa every year and keeps us deeply connected to the tradition and the lineage and as well as the cultural context that we're learning these things from and wrestling with the beauty and the challenges of that you know it's not all easy um and and to know that they also were like legitimately authorized to teach from Sayadu Upandita, right? And to be like, this was this is like a legitimate lineage is something that feels like totally essential and important for my view, especially in the context where, and I will be very careful about going on my, the challenges for me of how, when the Dhamma and mindfulness and uh, the sort of, decontextualizing ingredients of Vipassana practice have entered the mainstream of the West, uh, the United States or whatever, and sort of don't talk about the Buddha, don't acknowledge a tradition, uh, you know, don't, are charging money for it, all of these things that I think of that as like incredibly problematic for sure. And though I feel less called to be like the, the police on it anymore. I think at one point I felt more call to that but yeah so i think it's always good it's always good to be careful of like where are we you know where are we doing something because it feels legitimate where it may it feel legitimate and also be kind of problematic or complex in terms of how it plays socially we we it's like you go to burma it's like this thing actually it's so you do this a gazillion times a day, right? When you're at the monastery and it becomes so deeply ingrained in our understanding of practice. And there's something about that, that it's like, okay, it's legitimate of like, do we, where, where does this play out, this hand gesture play out in terms of, you know, everything we're doing. And yeah, anyway, I, I think that something I heard recently that of, of an old professor of mine told me that's just so important around all of this stuff is like, Someone said this to him. He was talking about, it was a story about a Confederate soldier who after the war ended up falling in love and marrying a black woman and then became an anarchist working in like integrated labor unions, right? Like this sense of like, never put the period on anybody. Right, like you might see transgressions, you might see like things that like really should be like, that's a problem. I mean, we need to sort of like deal with it. And, but the sense of like, no one ends at like, this is who they are. And this is how we're totally always gonna identify them, including ourselves. And that we have that sense of like, there's room to grow, there's room to be careful, there's room to understand and be patient and compassionate, you know, with all of us. Thank you. That reminds me of that story, Steve, that your mom sent to you and about how people congeal or they don't congeal or something at the end of their lives, like, um, or at some point in their life. I don't know if you know what I'm referencing, but. I do. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah, it was a stack of mail when I came home from Asia every year or two. And uh, in it, there was a 
clipping she took from a book by Gail Godwin called The Finishing School. And uh, um, to roughly para paraphrase, some, she's just talking about, she's talking to this young man, Justin, and saying that, that few people are really themselves in this life. They may be, they may be, end up being a really great person, but we can expect no more surprises from them. Whereas the person who is um, real uh, keeps growing, she writes keeps making new trysts with life and doesn't congeal into their final self. And so that our work is the work of non, not congealing. That's our work. That's what the Brahma Viharas and mindfulness is for. Does that sound about right, Amanda? Yeah. Spot on. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right, well, thank you, good friends. Good to see you here all again. Mm. Please take care of yourselves and one another, whoever you bump into out there in the world.